Welcome to the Museum Roadshow. Today we're sharing stories that Alex Saar shared with us in November of 2012 at the Becker County Museum. Alex kept a diary that he wasn't supposed to do of his experiences in World War II with a 10-man bomber crew flying the B-24. And he wrote a book with the help of uh, Cletus Williams and Wes Oman, as he's sharing these stories with us. Alex and his crew were part of the 460th Bombardment Group Heavy B-24 Bomb Flight, crew number 29. It was a 10-man airplane. It was big. It was almost like a little house. There was two decks, a lower deck with a bombardier, the navigator, and I was down there. Up above was a pilot and co-pilot that drove the plane. And behind them was the um, engineer. He had a turret all of his own, and he was the engineer. And then there was two waste gunners in back. And then we had Jimmy in the tail. And we had a lot of, it was roomy, but crowded with wires and stuff. And in Fetus's writing, he described the, the uh, walkway was nine inches wide. We had to walk over a nine inch walk, get from the front of the plane to the back of the plane. And when the pilot asked if I would go back and help, I took an um, oxygen tank with me, and the Bombay, Bombay doors was open, and I walked that nine-inch deal there. And I'll tell you, I sweat, but I got over it. But if I wouldn't have had that oxygen with, with me, I'd have never made it. Because without oxygen at 18,000 feet, it took about 10 seconds before you were in trouble. We landed at Casablanca, North Africa, and there we waited for about two weeks to get to Italy, to, uh, to the airfield in Italy called San Pendrazio. And when we got to the airfield, the airfield was empty. They'd, every plane they had had been shot down on a raid in the Alps. They would come in the valley and the Germans had guns above them and shot them down. In, in this, I think it was Po Valley, they called it. So we had to sit there and wait for airplanes from North Africa. And in about two weeks, they started to ferry them in. And uh, uh, it wasn't long, and we replaced the 100. We had 100 airplanes back again. They were used in the African campaign. But they were pretty well overhauled. A lot of them had patches on them where they had been hit and stuff. But they were in good mechanical conditions. And we flew 10 missions out of uh, Italy. We left, the ver our very first mission, we left for a, um, a mission in northern Italy. Not a very far mission. <clears throat> It was 70 above when we took off, and it was 57 below over the target. And our oxygen masks froze up. Two of the guys passed out because they, they couldn't get any oxygen, and then we finally discovered it. You hit them on that there and knocked the ice out of them, and then they could breathe again. And one guy was mad as a dickens. He says, I had a good dream, and you guys woke me up. <laughs> But the guns wouldn't fire either because of the cold. The cold shrunk the mechanism. We learned that we had to have a loosen up the mechanism to to uh, fire a gun in cold weather. All this stuff we didn't. We had to learn. We didn't learn it in the United States going to school. They told us nothing. So we learned. We we come of age on the very first mission. Eighteen thousand was our, our normal deal. And when we went over the Alps, we had a, a, a payload of about a ton. And the, the Alps was about 18,000 feet in their, their own right, you know, and we had a heck of a time keeping above them. I, when we went over the Alps, we, we missed them peaks by about 50 feet. 
that we we didn't have any clearance at all because it it that was at our top. And our last mission, we went to Steyr, Austria, with a hundred planes, and the Germans were waiting for us, and we lost 51 planes, and we come home with 49. We lost 450 men and 51 planes in about 20 minutes. They had their Messerschmitt 110s and two motored deals with uh, rockets under their wings and they sat back and they shot our people down and then they'd cripple them and the plane would have to get out of the formation and then the 109s would come and finish him off. And that was about the worst disaster that I did see during the war. We didn't have any air cover except two P-38s did show up accidentally and got in there and mixed it up or we'd have lost every plane we had. I mean, it was just a miracle that they showed up. The rest of the war, in, we, we transferred to England and, and that was a different ball game over there. We had escort, <clears throat> enough to keep the enemy of planes away from us. The only thing we had to worry about was flak. In England, we were the lead plane of a thousand planes that went to Berlin. <clears throat> And on another one, we went to Paris, and we were the lead plane again, and we had a thousand planes there. But that was unusual. A thousand planes was not the, not the usual run. It was maybe 500 planes, out of England especially. Out of Italy, Italy wasn't a big war at all. It was a kind of a, a Mickey Mouse deal. But uh, we'd go up there and with a maybe well, sometimes a hundred planes, sometimes with only 50 planes. It depends on what we were bombing. And we, we bombed <coughs> Brest, Germany, and then we went over uh, part of the ocean and we got into Russia, and then we had Norway, we flew over Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and then home. It was our longest mission, we were 10 and a half hours. And we didn't have much gas when we got back either. That, uh, but uh, it was it was a good mission. It was a, a a real fun mission, I would say. To see all that country in one day, you know. But um, I use the word divine intervention, and I believe that God was with us all the way. The most exciting day of my life I want to share with you, and that was on D-Day. It was 11.30 at night when the assembly bell rang on the 5th of June, 1944. And when that bell rang at night, we'd never flown on a night mission before. When that bell rang, we knew that D-Day had come. So we run up to the hall and sure enough, this was it. They want us to go to our airplanes, point the guns straight up, be ready to get strafed. If the Germans had advance notice on this invasion, to be ready. And we sat in those airplanes for two and a half hours with our guns pointed up and nothing happened. And then about three o'clock, we took off and we kept circling around the island until dawn. And at 5.58 in the morning of June 6th, we dropped the first bombs on Omaha Beach. The Germans were fooled for a little while. They weren't there. But by the time we went back and reloaded and come back in the afternoon, the Germans had come with all their artillery. The boats were sunk in the ocean and the beach, the Omaha beach was red with the blood of our boys that didn't make it. 4,000 boys we lost in 12 hours. There was 160,000 that crossed the channel that morning and 4,000 of them didn't see the sunset that day. <clears throat> It didn't take long, and our troops 
were moving pretty good. They were moving right along and the Germans we were pushing them back and we knew that if we'd have failed on that invasion, we'd have lost the war. That was the critical part. But Eisenhower, bless his heart and God bless him, he had everything figured out right. He'd done everything right. And we're sitting here free, to, free people today because the war was figured out right, that we didn't lose the war. I want to tell them about the Monte Cassino story. Yes, do that. My daughter took a trip to Italy a few years ago on a tour. And they were on a tour bus going up toward the mountains. And way on a high peak was Monte Cassino. It was an old abbey established by monks way back when. And when the invasion of Italy started at Salerno and Anzio, the troops got that far and they couldn't get beyond there because all of the, the Germans had taken it over and they controlled the roads and they just blasted everybody. And there was a cemetery there, mostly British and Canadian soldiers because the Americans were still fighting their way up. And my daughter read Alex's book and she saw the Monte Casino reference in that book. And she went back to her pictures that she took on that trip and she had about a dozen beautiful pictures of Monte Cassino. Now this is 50 years, 60 years fast forward from the war. And so she blew them up. Alex is a little uh, challenged when it comes to see sight and hearing. So she made them big and plain. <laughs> I took him over to show him the pictures. He looked at Monte Cassino and he started crying. Mm -hmm. And he said, just a minute, I want to get you something. He walked into his office. And he's got a picture frame about that big in there with all of his medals. And here was a little cutter key about that long on a string. He said, you see that cutter key in that string? That was the first 1,000 pound bomb that dropped on Monte Casino the day we raided it. Now you talk about a small world <laughs> sitting at his kitchen table looking at those pictures, and I'm telling the story about Monte Casino, and he brings the Cotter Key. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's a small world. The Cotter Key was a safety device that it was, the, when the Cotter Key was in there, that bomb was not armed. It couldn't go off. It was, and then it was on a piece of wire when the bomb dropped, the Cotter Key stayed in the plane and the bomb went below. And then there was a fan on the, on the bomb that had to revolve so many times before it was armed again. It was a double safety. So it would get away from the airplane before it went off. So it was double, double deal. They call it the arming pin is, is the one I saved. And I, I knew that that was going to be a historic mission. So I saved that pin and put it put it in my stuff and then I, I kept it. Uh, during the war, when the mass production of the B-24, they turned out a B-24 every 64 minutes. Uh, that's hard to believe, but that's what they done. I was at Denver and El Paso, Texas. Roswell, New Mexico, Laredo, Texas, and then the crews formed at El Paso, Texas. That's where we, they put their names up on the bulletin board and we met in the hall and uh, they, we met, had a table that we sat down and introduced one another. I'll never forget our, our navigator. He was a kind of a farm guy and he was eating an orange and he broke it in half and he said, you want a half an orange? And, he said, <laughs> and that was his nature. He would give you anything. He was, he was an officer, he was, but he never showed his, his authority at all. He was just a good old guy. We was on fire one time. We got hit over the Anzio beachhead and uh, our plane was hit and uh, we had one motor on fire and we lost our formation and we got lost coming home 
and the pilot says to Oswald, the, or the navigator, where are we? He says, I don't know, I've been sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> the pilot says, sleeping when we're on fire? He says. <laughs> uh, we, were, we left uh, Denver, Colorado for Laredo on a troop train. And about midnight, we was out of Oklahoma City, and our, our troop train was crowded, but I had an empty seat by me. And the train stopped for just a minute in Oklahoma City, and then started out again, and down the aisle comes a, a rather unattractive woman, and I thought, oh boy, is she gonna sit with me? <laughs> and she did. <laughs> Her first words to me, my name is Eleanor Roosevelt, my my husband is your president, and he wants me to tell you how much we appreciate you guys. And she visited with me for a good, oh, I'd say 20 minutes. And when she left, I thought she was the prettiest doggone woman i ever seen in my life. <laughs> she was a remarkable person, remarkable. Of the 10 men of us, only one person was injured, he lost this finger. He was taking a picture like this, and a piece of shrapnel come through and took his finger right off like a surgeon would take it off. And that was our bombardier that lost it, and he was kind of a, a goof off anyhow. And we said, <laughs> we, we said, just Ed, you lucky bugger. That finger would have got you in trouble in, in, in uh, St. Paul when you got home, and now you don't have to worry no more. <laughs> I was a real old man. I was 21 years old. <laughs> One of the oldest on our crew. We had some that were 20, we had some that were 19, and we had some that was 18. And our little tail gunner, Jimmy Newcomb, showed up late for making the crew, and when he showed up, he looked like he was 14 years old, well-dressed, good-looking kid, and he said, I'm Jimmy Newcomb, I'm your tail gunner. And the pilot says to me, boy, he says, we're gonna have to babysit that kid, he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turned out that Jimmy saved our lives. He was riding along in the, in the um, vapor trail. And Jimmy spotted a, a German 109 coming through the there, and he shot without asking any question. He just let him have it. And the guy had to drop down. He, he destroyed his uh, oxygen. He didn't shoot the plane down, but he had to get out of there. And when we get down on the ground, I said to the pilot, I said, this is the kid that we were gonna babysit. <laughs> Um, Jerry was a, um, a half-breed native Indian, and he was small. His name was Little, and he was Little. And that ball turret underneath the airplane was the worst spot in the world to sit. It was, you raised it up to get in, and then they lowered it, and you were sitting down there all by yourself. And we took a hit right close to the plane and the concussion was so great the, the turret come up into the plane and then settled back and when it settled back <coughs> it broke the hydraulic hoses the hydraulic hoses and he was marooned down there so the pilot the intercom was okay we could talk to him and the pilot uh, sent me and another guy back to try to crank there was a a manual way to get him up. And we got him up halfway and the thing stuck. It uh, bent the tracks. And I looked over and here laid a 36 inch crowbar that the night crew evidently had <laughs> forgotten. And with that crowbar, we straightened the track and got him cranked up. When we got back, why, the guy interrogating us, a, a lieutenant colonel, said, Jerry, when you come down, couldn't you move anything? And Jerry said, the only thing that moved was my bowels. <laughs> There's one other thing.
thing in the drama of that is that the B-24s, they rationed the gasoline. They had just enough gasoline to get to their bomb mission and get back. And they, they were running out of gasoline. And so they, he had to get, get the, the turret up because they couldn't land. It's couldn't land point. with that down. No. And when they when they landed, they had no gasoline. Everything said empty. Everything empty. Another miracle. Uh, the bombardier, when he lost his finger, they turned it over to me. That I had switches up in my turret, up in the nose, that I could drop the bombs. Uh, two switches: one to open the bomb bay door, and the other switch to drop the bombs. And they called me a toggleer. <laughs> and for about three missions, I was the the bombardier. And what a thrill that was to drop those bombs and holler, bombs away. <laughs> yeah, I was really, I was really enthusiastic in, that I could do that. I didn't have to use a, a bomb site or nothing. We dropped on a smoke bomb that the lead plane would drop the bomb the smoke bomb, and then we would drive or fly up to that bomb and then drop on, on the smoke bomb. So uh, there was nothing really important that I'd done except it hit two switches. <laughs> I'm the only living one that remained, and they all died an, a natural, normal death here in the States. How old are you right now? I'm going to be 95 on November 20th, and you can send the presents uh, to... <laughs> <laughs>
our spaghetti, our, our, our dessert went out the window right behind the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story of Marie. <laughs> We didn't have refrigeration in, in Italy at all. No refrigeration at all. And somebody got the idea, let's make some ice cream. So we took our bicycles and we rode out in the country, took candy bars and cigarettes, and we traded for cream. And we got, oh, well, maybe 20, 30 quarts of cream. And we brought that back. And then the kitchen chipped in with um, uh, condensed milk and m made a mixture of vanilla and got everything going. Then they put it on an airplane. And we went up to 12,000 feet. <laughs> and we froze, we froze the yogurt. <laughs> and, and I said it was the American dollar at work. We burned, a, <laughs> we burned up 1,000 gallons of gas to make 10 gallons of gas. <laughs> <laughs> I want to touch, I, I will talk to the um, Holy Spirit uh, kids the other day, the little ones, the six and seven year olds, and I wasn't going to mention it, the poverty that I seen over there, but I told them anyhow. And there was a little boy and a girl that showed up at our camp with just a towel around their little hind ends, a boy and a girl. And it was fairly cold out there on the desert, but they th walked three miles to rob the garbage cans and get in there with both hands and lift that garbage up that wasn't fit for a pig and eat it. I get emotional even talking about it. Well, one day the little girl showed up without her brother. And I said to her, where is your brother today? Oh, she says, he isn't hungry anymore. He died. <clears throat> if that isn't enough to just break you up. And then I, we used to steal food from, from the kitchen and give them bread that we had in our pockets and stuff. But you know, I think I could have done more. I could have had candy bars for him and stuff but I didn't, and I'll, I'll live with that for all my life. I remarked the other day when I talked to the Catholic uh, school that I met a Catholic girl in Denver, and I met her at a, a military dance, and she said, I'm a Catholic, and I said, I'm a Lutheran. And she says, well, I'll put up with you until I find something better. <laughs> But anyhow, I only had uh, four weeks with her on the weekends. We bowled and we roller skated and we rode horses and we just had a tremendous time and she cooked Sunday dinner for me for those four weeks. And finally the time come to say goodbye. And she went to her room and she says, Alex, I want you to have something. And she gave me her, her confirmation <coughs> Bible. She says, take this Bible and take it with you. It'll protect you. So it fit right in on my flying suit. I wore it over my heart for 38 missions. And I didn't get a scratch. And the crew come through. That Bible helped us. I know we had a guardian angel riding with us because we had 27 holes patches on our ship where 27 shells come through and, and missed every one of us. Alex is certainly an interesting man. If you'd like to read more of his stories, you can purchase the book that he wrote at the Becker County Museum here in Detroit Lakes, or you can get a copy of these ex episodes on TV3 by purchasing a DVD. Just contact TV3 here at Detroit Lakes. And remember, on the Museum Roadshow history repeats itself every four hours. Mm -hmm.